Hey everyone, this is part three of our Enron series. If you need to catch up, check out our first two episodes called Enron, the Enabler and the Architect and Enron, Deal or No Deal. We will be back next week with all new episodes. Love your faces. This call may be monitored and recorded for quality assurance. This job would be great if it wasn't for the fucking customers. We were always this stupid and did you take lessons? Just calm down. Oh, fuck you. You can't handle the truth. This call may be monitored and recorded for quality assurance. In other words, be nice, asshole. That's the partners in crime. Now we're going to get to where the, the big public crime that really led to some of the questions <laughs> was ultimately California. California deregulated its energy market in this bizarre compromise between free market advocates and consumer <clears throat> advocates, right? It was a strange and complicated system, and quite frankly, some of this is their fault, right? It's the lawmakers' fault. They made it so ridiculous and so easy to, to manipulate. But once again, they assumed that companies would do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do, which is the dumb assumption. Here's an example. One loophole that the energy companies figured out was for the price of energy reserves. Before the, the deregulation went into effect, the reserves had been priced at $1 per megawatt hour. The loophole allowed energy companies to spike, to spike the price up to $10,000. It went from $1 to $10,000 $10, overnight. How can they do that? Because the law didn't say they couldn't. <clears throat> Enron figured out they could actually spike the price up to infinity, right? Now, when the 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 people came in to look at it, they they realized it went from a dollar to ten thousand, and they freaked out. But there was no limit; it could keep going up and up and up, and there was nothing to stop them <laughs> from doing it. I don't even understand. Nobody thought like that's what they outside did outside of there. That's that, what they priced the reserve power for. And nobody thought to outside like rape California of their organization. That this was... That nobody was going to notice. Right. Nobody, everybody was like, huh, but, do do? But they were like, Yeah, but they were like, even if they notice, there's nothing they can do to stop it because there's no law. <laughs> so then what? What the fuck? <laughs> we really needed to go into business like I know, 15 right? years ago right. and just make up some random shit, get a building, get a bunch of people hyped up about it, and make a gazillion dollars and quit. <laughs> right. And go live someplace. <laughs> Basically, what Enron did was they figured out all different ki types of strategies to move power out of California, overbook transmission lines so that no power could get back in, and basically hold the power hostage until California agreed to pay like a thousand percent higher prices, right? It caused rolling. That's gouging. Totally, though. totally. It caused rolling blackouts where people died in car accidents. They were trapped in elevators. Um, people suffered from heat stroke. On and on and on. And they, the the energy traders at Enron, just did nothing. They called some of the strategies like Fat Boy, uh -huh. Death Star. Get Shorty, Ricochet. Like, when the oh lawyers actually heard the names of these strategies, they, they really, they didn't tell them to stop. They just told them to change the names of the strategies because they knew if they went public, it would sound bad. The whole thing looks bad. It's, it is It is bad. bad. There's actually some audio of the traders. <laughs> so this is the Enron trader calling... To one of the power plants they control, okay. telling them to force an outage to create, to basically take the whole system down for maintenance to create a shortage. In other words, don't put it in writing. Uh, when you finish your normal QL, so for hour day one, right, which will be tomorrow, right, uh, we want you guys to get a little creative, okay, and come up with a reason to go down. Okay. Anything you want to do over there? Um, anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. This is stuff that we could be doing tonight. That's good. You know, we need to, do, we need to come down and inspect this switch on the steam turbine. This, uh, this switch on this. 
Bill and this guy need to have their asses beat. So basically, they spend the rest of this call basically <clears throat> flat out telling them, figure out, a way. figure out a way to turn off the electricity. And here's another one. This one's even worse. These are two. Now, here's the thing. The people who actually worked at the power plants, there's audio of them, which I couldn't find, but they talk about it in the book, of them being like, this is fucking bullshit and we know it, but we can't stop. Like, Enron is telling us to do this. They knew what was going on, but they owned them. They had to do it. disgusting they talk about this freely in one of the other calls they flat out say like we're stealing money and they were like can you rephrase that he's like all right we're arbitraging the money it was like good christ they knew what they were doing what the oh and now what they were talking about there was all these politicians were saying we're gonna get our fucking money back for you right, right. and what they were saying is oh i heard you're gonna give the money back like My grandma million shit it's oh. absolutely awful now when the question started enron's lawyers actually met with the head trader who proudly outlined all of the ways they were doing this right oh. told them the names of it and everything was super proud of it and flat out said look we're never going to get caught because the regulators aren't smart enough to figure out what we're doing they flat out said that. And the lawyers didn't tell him to stop for months. They just wanted him to change the names, which is sad. Yeah, let's not call this Death Star. Let's call yeah, it. not smart, yeah. right? So gaming the, the actual, the, the California energy market while, you know, transporting power out, raising prices, then bringing it back in, has one way they made money off California. The other way they made money off California was just betting that the price was going to go up. And that was easy to bet because they knew they could make the price go up. Yeah. So when you can manipulate the market like that, then of course you're going to make that bet. Right, and you're always going to yeah, and you're going to bet on yourself because it's it's a given. Exactly. Now the other thing that their other excuse when the the guy kind of outlined to the lawyers everything that was that they were doing, one of his defenses was, well, the other energy companies are doing that too. And all I could think was like explaining to my five-year-old, like, if Geo jumps off a bridge, are you going to do that too? <laughs> like, this is something that you should not have to explain to corporate executives in charge of the seventh largest corporation in America. That's ridiculous. But it is because that's what happens a lot. Probably more than we even know. Absolutely. Just since this happened and other things have happened since then, people find it easier where they find different ways. Mm -hmm. There are always ways that you can you can fix your books or totally. launder money or whatever. Exactly. The thing that the, these, these traders fail to realize is if your goal is to deregulate every market, do you really think other markets are going to look at California and be like, yeah, we want that? Even though this didn't rape in California, <laughs> didn't, did nothing to serve the purpose of getting other markets to deregulate, the traders justified it to themselves that, well, California didn't regulate, deregulate the way we told them to. And if they are going to do, if they are going to do what we say, then they deserve what they get. And they felt that they were just, what they were doing was serving as a warning to other markets to do what they say or else. Uh -huh. Not realizing that other markets don't have to deregulate at all. Uh, right. I, they really felt that way. That like... They really, all of them had got you complexes. You deserve to get screwed because right. you didn't do what we told you to do. So they held electricity for... Hostage. For ransom. Yeah. Ransom, yeah. They, totally. That's fucked up. Totally. That is fucked up. And the whole time, Lily, Skilling and Lay are going out there saying, we're on the side of angels. We had nothing to do with this. Like, this is just California's problem. They didn't deregulate, and they should have. Like, oh, absolutely ridiculous. Skilling actually made a joke a few days before he had the balls to go to California and make a speech somewhere where a woman came up and threw a pie at him. Right? Ah. The joke was, what's the difference between the California, California and the Titanic? 
When the Titanic sank, at least the lights were on. He oh. literally made that joke while people are dying. dying. He's a piece of fucking shit. Oh my god. God. So R. the governor of California was begging. Now there, there's the, an overlap here between when, while Bill Clinton was still president, and when W got, got into office. Uh-huh. Right. The California governor had eventually was like begging W to step in and help. Right. Put price caps in to help them. Right. And but he was the California Democrat was a um, was a likely candidate to run against W in 2004, and the people of California were blaming the governor for it. So it was in his best interest to just sit back and let it happen. Right. So he did dick, right? What helped a little bit was before Clinton got out of office, his energy secretary, that must have been amazing, Bill Richardson actually declared a bit of a state of emergency, which helped a little bit, uh-huh. right? But right after he did that, Ken Lay had the balls. So he called Bill Richardson and asked if, if he could use his emergency powers to just go ahead and deregulate the entire energy industry. <laughs> Fuck, really? Which Ken Lay's own lobbyists in, in Washington were like, that was the dumbest, dumbest shit you could have done. Could've asked. Like, what the serious fuck? And Bill Richardson's aides were just like, we could not believe he was asking us to do this. <laughs> like, it was wow. in, like the hubris the of these people. Now, here's the thing. Everybody asked at this time, where's FERC? The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh-huh. Right, it was the group that should have been able to step in and put some price caps in and stop it. Right, but here's guess who was in charge of FERC? A guy who was handpicked by Ken Lay, that George W. Bush appointed because Ken Lay asked him to, and all FERC had to do was nothing, and they did nothing very well. Right now, eventually Congress stepped in and forced FERC to actually do something, which ended the crisis, fucking finally. But The three companies, Enron, Dynegy, and Reliant, ended up stealing over $30 billion from the state of California. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. It was brutal. And they really used the money that they got from California to fill the earnings hole from them, to actually get real money Right, to get real money now. Right? Uh, So the question is, they've got all this shit. You can make up whatever profits you want and, like... You can hide all your debt. Why did it all go bust? Why did it go bad? Right? Here's where we finally start to go down. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So there are really three reasons. One is the bull market of the 90s went bust in the spring of 2000. Jim Chanos, uh, invest- an investment analyst, president of an, an investment firm, a short seller, told Bethany McLean, author of, one of the authors of the book, uh-huh. to look at it. And the... Other is Sharon Watkins, the the whistleblower. Uh huh. So let's talk about Sharon Watkins first. After there was some restructuring done at Enron, she went to work for Andy Fasta, who she always, she never trusted. Right? Uh-huh. She was like, everybody knew Andy did not have a strong moral compass. Like we knew he was shady as fuck. So he put her in charge of looking at this this structured finance group called, that they were calling the Raptors, and uh-huh. she realized this was insane fraud right from the jump. And she was like, oh, she was like, I can't believe Arthur Anderson signed off on this. We've committed horrible fraud. Companies that are outed for fraud, like, they don't survive. But companies that come clean themselves, they do. They do, yeah. So she wrote this anonymous letter to Ken Lay, expecting him to do something. Telling him, you need to have another law firm and another accountant firm, not Arthur Anderson and not Vincent and Elkins, come in and do an investigation to figure this out, right? Well, he didn't address it. So finally, well, she wrote it. Not. She wrote the letter anonymously. Finally, she identified herself, had a meeting with him. He was like horrified, but th- he was more horrified that somebody found was, out. Right. He asked her two questions. One, well, Andy's a good CFO, right? And it was like, oh, mother, are you not listening? And the other question is, have you told anybody outside the company this? Oh, Jesus. And of course, he went and hired Vincent and Elkins to do an investigation, but told them they weren't allowed to question any of the decisions made by Arthur Anderson. And they were the ones that signed off on the deal. So you're going to have the criminal investigate the crime? The other cr- yeah. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Here, crackhead, can you straighten up this crack house? <laughs> but you know what they did do a lot of research on? Whether or not they could fire Sharon Watkins. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm so sure. Now, good Christ. Fuck? Eventually, they 
they came to the realization that if they fired Sharon Watkins, she would have grounds for a legal suit. And Enron would have to prove that what she was saying was false. And they couldn't do that. So they didn't fire her. They just transferred her to a different division away from Andy Fastow. Right? But what they did do was once the investigation, I put that in air quotes, was complete, they actually sent out the findings of the investigation along with the memo to the entire company naming Sharon Watkins, saying that she did this, but she only got her information from office gossip that she overheard. (laughs) They basically made her look like a gossipy bitch that was trying to bring down the entire company. And they sent that out to the entire company. Wow. That's fucked up. Like, I I said this before, like, Sharon Watkins, the whistleblower, is a fucking hero. It took so, an unbelievable amount of guts and courage to actually be the one to stand up and say, the emperor has no goddamn clothes. Right. I mean, can you imagine if they were that far into doing whatever they could to make billions of dollars, what they could have done to her? Uh huh. They could they could have ruined her financially. They could have physically harmed her. There are so many things oh, yeah. that they could have done to her. Totally. That would have made her life even just a living hell. It literally, in my mind, it kind of put her in physical danger. Yeah. With how that company was really like a cult. Yeah. Yeah. She could have been hurt. Oh, seriously. They put her in danger. In my yeah. Mind. The other reason that it came down, like I said, Jim Chanos is kind of a financial legend. He called out a company that was like a hot it stock in the 80s mm-hmm. as a Ponzi scheme. And everybody like, were they? it was super controversial. Everybody's like, he's wrong. Six months later, filed for bankruptcy and everybody lost their money. Huh. So he really became this legend. And he's been a short seller for over 20 years, his firm, which is unheard of. Like... He is smart. He is known kind of like we are. Remember with our recording systems, Mm -hmm. how we were like, we're the Sherlock Holmes of recording systems. Right. If we see a problem, we will dig and dig and dig and dig and dig until we fucking figure it out. He was known as kind of a Sherlock Holmes of financial statements. He could dig through and really get down in there. Well, Enron was really kind of, was still blowing up and everybody had this company line on it. And he he finally flipped open their financial statements Mm -hmm. one day. And he started digging and asking their competitors, asking analysts, just digging and digging and digging. And he's like, I cannot tell how they make their money. I just can't figure it out. He's like, this is, he's, but he didn't think it was a fraud. He just thought it was a bad business. Right. So he reached out to Bethany McLean. But because of what he did in the 80s, reporters would actually reach out to Jim Tanos looking for stories. Right. Right. He reached out to Bethany McLean, who was not a beat reporter, but he was like, she was a financial reporter with Fortune. And he was like, you should really look at their, their financial statements. Tell, you tell me how they're making money. If you figure it out, let me know. So she wrote this article. And it was the first article that really questioned Enron. And it really kind of opened the floodgates to everybody uh-huh. else asking the question. And the basic question she asked in the article was, how does Enron make its money? And nobody could tell her. <laughs> nobody Shit. could tell her. And everybody was like, oh. And it kind of made everybody, like the first public person to question it right really kind of cracked the door open and finally just opened the floodgates right the other thing that caused it to go wrong was the bull market went bust when the bull market was raging Mm -hmm. everybody's throwing money out and tons of money's coming right but now that you not every investment is going to be solid now you're actually going to pay attention ask more questions get more in depth right and suddenly enron stock started to drop because everybody's stocks were starting to drop. When the bull market went bust, it was done. But the problem with the stock going down is now all of a sudden those structured finance deals, some of that debt has to start going back on the books. And some of it would cause actually to to force restatements. So basically they'd have to go to statements they issued back in 1998 and be like, we lied. Oh my God. It's like robbing a bank. The way Sharon Watkins put it, it's like robbing a bank. And then trying to go back two years later and pay the bank back. Back. Oh like, my God. It doesn't quite work that way. Well, Assholes. That would ruin their rating as well. Their credit score too. Exactly. That Which would... also caused more debt <clears throat> to go yeah. back on the books. So while the stock was crashing, Skilling was actually made the CEO. Ken Lay finally stepped down, gave him the job. But Skilling, once again, is the designer of ditches, not the digger of ditches. He had been all throughout his reign at Enron, anytime he said 
his ideas or he said the, the stock price should go higher. Everybody mm-hmm. just believed him and the stock price went higher. <laughs> All of a sudden now he's a CEO and we're not in a bull market anymore. And people started questioning shit. He was like, I'm not having fun because I'm not the master of the universe anymore. Uh-uh. Whatever he said didn't just magically appear anymore. Right, right. So he flat out kept telling people, I'm not having fun. And it was like, who said being a CEO was fun. Was fun, asshole? That's what you wanted. It wasn't it fun because now all of a sudden you're not, you know, king shit on right. top of Turd Mountain here. <laughs> like, good Christ. Now, the perfect example of when the cracks started to show was he was on an investor conference call where one of the analysts who was just kind of wondering out loud, he wasn't really like pushing. Uh-huh. Some people say he sounded aggressive. I didn't really hear him sound aggressive. I just, he just sounded like he was pondering something uh-huh. out loud. He said, you're the only major company who can't produce a balance sheet or a cash flow statement. Like that's a simple thing. That's not really a hard question, right? Uh-huh. The audio of this, Jeff Skilling actually goes, well, you, <laughs> you, 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 yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And the, uh, But here's the thing. The analyst goes, thank you? <laughs> and Jeff Skilling goes, asshole. Oh, my God. A Fortune 500 CEO losing his shit to an investor, investment analyst <laughs> in public. Like, people freaked out up and down Wall Street. Like, CEOs are not, suppo- they're supposed, supposed to be to, able to handle yeah. shit. Yeah, you don't lose your cool, especially with an analyst, not you Not know? like that. No. So, all of a sudden, it made people more suspicious. Like, what's really, if he lost it like that, what's really going Over on? somebody just saying to you, why don't you have these? Why don't you have a cash flow? Cash flow, flow. yeah. Why don't you it have that? It really made people so much question it even more. So, finally, Skilling went to lay and said... I want to step down. And he fucking peaced out. He sold $66 million worth of stock and walked away from tons of benefits, even though his contract said he should have gotten millions of dollars if he quit or even if he stayed until the end of 2000. He just walked away because he knew shit was going south. Now, here's the thing. The simple answer is that he knew what was coming. Like, he could see. And he kind of did what Rebecca Mark did. Like, he's he felt like he could peace out the company would maybe last for another two years. Right. And you could be like, it was fine when I left, guys. Right. right. But here's the thing. People at Enron weren't necessarily all gung-ho for Enron. They Me were gung-ho too. for him. They felt that his ideas made them this much money. And they felt at this point he had led them into the woods and peaced out before leading them back out. <sighs> right? So people at Enron were furious with him. Right. But he didn't understand why everybody wasn't high fiving him and congratulating him on his brand new life. And they were like, fuck you. The stock That's price right. is cratering and you've said it's going to go back up, but you're peacing out before you're you help leaving, us do it. So, yeah. Fuck you. Like, what the hell? Well, why would they even wait around for him to show them how to how to get the stock market back up mm-hmm. or the stock price back up? Because he never gave any actual sound advice on how to do anything. Exactly. He just came up with some ideas and said, do it. But he had everyone at Enron under his spell, where he would say shit and they would just believe it. They thought it was him and the leader and his leadership that did all this. They didn't realize that it didn't exist. And what they had was because of them. The fact that he really truly believed that everybody was going to be like, sweet! Good for you! No, not (sighs) good for you, asshole. (laughs) Now, his departure sent the stock crashing even further, Uh right? And the New York Times published reports about Andy Fastow's little structured finance deals, right? Because technically, he's the CFO of Enron, but he's also in charge of these these special purpose entities, which are right. technically separate companies. Right. And the New York Times found out that Andy Fastow supposedly was only spending three hours a week on these special purpose deals. On one of them alone, he made over $60 million. Three hours a week, $60 million. And he structured these deals... To be nothing but terrible for Enron. Like, he was Enron's CFO, and he was making deals that cut against them. And when the board... Well, how else can you get somebody to sign with a shady-ass company other than to give them the upper hand? He's in charge of both Enron as the CFO and the CEO of these special purpose entities, right? Uh So it's not like you have to get other people to sign with your shady-ass company. 
you're in charge of both. You don't have to make make it a good deal on on the special purpose entity side. And he had he was refusing like he had sidestepped all the questions for like two years about how much he was actually making. And he was making the board think that he was doing this out of the goodness of his heart. Oh, fuck you, and sir. they felt like they were they were like, Are we taking advantage of Andy? And it was like, no, he's taking advantage of you. Yeah, a little bit. So gauche. who are you looking? You shouldn't be on both sides of the transaction because who are you looking out for? Enron or the special purpose entity? Like, okay. He ended up, that's why he ended up eventually getting fired because <laughs> Enron's board figured out that he's their CFO and he's ripping them off on purpose. So when they finally found out that he made that much money at the expense of Enron, they fucking fired him. The new CEO that took in that took over after Skilling left, his name was Wally, he walked into a meeting where Fastow was sitting and said, You're fired. Pointed at another guy and said, You're the new CFO. Fastow just kind of sat frozen in the room and tried to a few minutes later tried to throw his two cents in about something else, and the new CEO stood up and yelled in his face, Didn't you fucking hear me? You're fucking fired. <laughs> lost his shit at this point arthur anderson starts shredding documents a couple of lawyers at arthur anderson literally started emailing around their document retention policy to remind people and basically because they knew shit was coming they with these articles they knew the sec was starting to look because once the these articles are published the sec actually devoted some resources to it so they knew it was coming and they knew as soon as they actually got a subpoena they couldn't shred shit <laughs> so they spent like two weeks Round the clock, weekends, nights, shredding, 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 shredding. The lawyers for the company was actually emailing around the retention policy saying, you know, anything that we don't deem relevant should be discarded after a period of time. And basically they flat out said, we would rather be convicted of obstruction of justice rather than being convicted of fraud. They shredded over a ton of paper in one week, more than than they've shredded in the entire previous year. (laughs) <laughs> like they went to town shredding everything little shredding parties but here's the thing while they were shredding they actually finally started looking at all the shit they approved and they realized they were fucked they were like oh shit they find when they started destroying documents is when they realized just how fucked they were just how badly they had fucked this up oh my god and during this time lay actually while lay is literally selling off his stock like in huge chunks for the last right. year he's been selling off an, an average of like 2200 stocks a day in enron like in the end for the last four years of enron he made over 300 million dollars in stocks all right now during this entire time he's actually telling the telling his employees that they should still buy stock because you're gonna look back and realize this was an incredible opportunity to buy all this stock right now when the price was so low Meanwhile, he can't get rid of his shit fast enough. Now, he actually, and this part pissed me off. It all pisses me off. But this part I found to be incredibly insulting. Around this time was when September 11th happened. And he actually compared the way that the press was questioning them to September 11th. He's like, like the United States uh, is under attack, we are under attack as well. What a prick. Oh, my God. He should have been shot in the fucking head for that. You don't get to compare people asking your company legitimate questions about how you run your business to a publicly traded company uh, to that's terrorists. Sickening. That's like, sickening. It was extraordinary. Now, they realized shit was going. There was no way to save this company. There was no, all this debt had to go back onto the balance sheets. They had to flat out admit it. They had to wish, issue, you know, corrected financial statements. Like, it was it was done. Right. It was done. At the last possible minute, they reached out to one of their competitors, a smaller energy company named called Dynagy, and they asked if they would buy Enron. Now, at first, they were like all gung-ho about it. They were like, sure. And they announced the deal and the basic kind of structure that they had in place. Right. But the deal fell apart for three reasons. <laughs> um, one was that reporters were finding out more stuff about the company's financial dealings that Enron didn't actually disclose to Dynegy. So they were, reporters are calling them and they're embarrassed as fuck because they're promising to buy this company saying, we know everything about it now. But they're finding out reporters actually know more than they do. Oh my God. So they were embarrassed as fuck. The other thing was, is at first Lay thought, well, 
we're going to merge. And Dynegy was like, no, 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 this is going to be an acquisition and there's no place for you here. You got to leave. <coughs> you drove this company into the toilet. You got to go. Well, then Lay, even though they thought that was the deal, Lay at the last minute said, no, 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 I'm not going anywhere. And they were like, well, you can't stay. And the final nail in the coffin was the traders, the people that had fucked up California so goddamn hard and who put together all these deals mm -hmm. that were awful. They felt like, well, all the upper guys got their millions. We want millions, too. They were failing to realize that they got their millions in bonuses from their shitty deals and raping California. Yeah, you didn't get $300 million, but you got enough you got that you nice could have been chunk. just fine. But they were like, but once again, it's not enough. It's this Enron culture of it's just not enough. I need more and more I and more. I don't get it. Like, I can't even, like, you, you just made a gazillion fucking dollars on top of... All the other side hustles you got. But it's it feels like it was to maintain a lifestyle. Like, they probably have purchased houses that were Cost, well outside yeah. of their means. Yeah, and now you got to keep it going because yeah. you fucked yourself. And that was stupid. Like, counting on that? No. That, no. You stupid. ran your hustle a little too long. And they negotiated, like, $90 million worth of bonus performance bonuses. Mm -hmm. And when the Dynagy CEO freaked out, he was like, performance bonuses? The company is on its ass. Performance for what? Right. What have you performed? When, but it goes back to this Enron culture of everybody's only looking out for themselves. They didn't care that them negotiating this sunk the entire deal because it's what's in it for me. Right. I don't give a fuck about the other 30,000 people who work here. Oh my it's God. about me. Oh, my God. So the deal fell apart. On December 4th, 2001, the executives had to fly up to New... They filed for bankruptcy, and the executives had to fly up to New York for the initial hearing, right? They actually flew up on Enron's brand-new, tricked-out private jet and stayed at the Ritz-Carlton to go tell the world that they had run out of money. Really? When you're a private jet. When that information came out publicly, they were like, we should have flown up on Southwest and stayed at the fucking Ramada Inn. That was the, it was such a horrible, like, PR move. Uh. Lay's wife ended up going on a television interview for 2020. And when they asked her about the $300 million, she said, it's all gone. We've lost everything, just like everybody else. Failing That's to mention that she's living in a $7 million Upper East Side penthouse in Manhattan. Failing to mention that they have over $20 million in fucking real estate all over the world. Like, failing to... Where did that $300 million go? For the, the ski house in Aspen that your kids, when the, when the stock started tanking, their son actually emailed them and was like, Oh, can I still fly everybody up for the party in Aspen private? And they were like, oh, yes, we'll figure it out. Oh Flying the daughter's bed. The, the bed story kills me. <laughs> Daughter was in Morocco for, like, school or something, and her, the bed in Morocco wasn't comfortable. So Ken Lay actually arranged to have her bed from home dismantled and flown on a private plane to Morocco and assembled for her. You want to know where $300 million goes? Yeah. That's where it fucking goes. Congress started investigating. Everyone else pled the fifth, like Ken Lay, everybody right. did. The only person that, that agreed to testify, and actually did, was Jeff Skilling. And this, once again, speaks to his fucking hubris. Because before, anytime he said anything, and everybody just believed it, he really right. believed he was just going to be able to go and explain his theory. And his theory was basically there was a run on the bank. Bad news came and everybody came and sold out their stock and that's what crashed it. Not that it was a fraud of a business, right? For like years. And he really <laughs> believed he could just go and explain that he's not an accountant. He only left for personal reasons and the run on the bank theory, right? And he played the shell game with responsibility. He was like, oh, it's the RAC's fault for not using the power that I gave it. It was Arthur Anderson's fault for not telling for not telling us no. It was Vincent and Elkin's job for not policing them and keeping them safe. It was the bank's fault for not pushing them harder for good deals, not just giving them the money and saying go. What Skilling failed to acknowledge is that he he's the one who put a weak man in charge of the RAC and knew it. He talked about it. 
openly over the years. Like Evan by, oh, he's just a he's just a wimp, but he claimed internally that it was okay because he was so hard and he would push for accountability and shut down bad deals. But he was just as weak as Evan Bai was because the traders would just threaten to leave and he would sign. <laughs> he failed to acknowledge that he pushed Arthur Anderson to approve anything and made them made them agree to anything by constantly threatening them that they would go to another firm. He, he wanted them to be yes men and he manipulated them to be that over the years. He pushed Arthur Anderson to get rid of the guy they had over his account because he asked far too many questions. He failed to acknowledge that story about John Olson, the guy that questioned it, that they fucking got fired from Merrill Lynch. Like he publicly blamed them, but he set them up for a failure completely. And he's sitting here saying like Barbara Boxer, a senator from California, she's like hammering him. And God, I'm going to reach out to Barbara Boxer because I would love to talk to her. Because she decimates him with one question. She's questioning him, questioning him, questioning him, saying, like, they're flat out in these emails that they uh -huh. got. They're outlining the California strategy. And she's like, you're sitting here saying that nobody knew that this was wrong or this was illegal. But in these emails, they're flat out saying, we're stealing money from California. Right. So you're, you're saying that you didn't think they did anything wrong, but they're saying themselves that they did. Fuck you. And he kept saying, well, you know. I, they kept asking him about Andy Fastow's deals. And he kept saying, look, I'm not an accountant. I'm not an accountant. I'm not an, a an accountant. And finally she said her last question, where did you get your education? And he goes, Harvard Business School. And it was like, mm. huh, I'm done. He was like, <laughs> yeah. She's not, uh, she Don't try to play stupid. Decimated him. Absolutely decimated him. It was amazing. You can't play dumb after all these years of claiming to be the smartest guy in the room and say, but I'm not an accountant. Right. Plus, you're telling me that they didn't teach you anything about accounting at Harvard fucking business, business school? school? Yeah. They skipped right over that. Thank you. Give me a fucking break. Now, here's the funny part. Sharon Watkins actually testified right alongside him. Really? Oh, yeah. Right? So, she nailed his ass. You should YouTube that shit it is a trip and a half he tried to make her look like she had no idea what she was talking about but he ended up just looking like a bratty little bully and she came off looking extremely credible because she had her fucking shit together she knew what was going on exactly everything she said she's <clears throat> and like she wasn't trying to hide anything right she flat out was like andy fastow would not have have put his hand in the company cookie jar if skilling hadn't approved it because skilling like he all he wanted all fast i wanted to do was please the boss right and he goes i don't know how she would have how she would know that and she's like um because cliff baxter told me that the guy that was dead uh -huh. right and she was like oh everybody at enron knew right that fast out only Fastow named one of his boys Jeffrey. <laughs> so how do we know? How hmm. do we know? Um, You're only sucking his dick. So. She pretty much pointed that out. She was like, fuck you. She made him look ridiculous. Like, she buried him. And it was just this kind of awesome moment. She did such a good job that reporters around the country <laughs> oh, sent sure Sharon Watkins flowers and congratulatory notes for what she did. Of course, her coworkers didn't feel the same way, but there were hard feelings at that point. But everybody else was just cheering her on. And she really, other than in Houston, she pretty much had everybody backing her up. They were like, good job, girl. <laughs> Bankers, investment, in investors, you know, analysts, rating agencies, they all claimed they were duped. But Congress presented them with emails where their own people, even <laughs> the department, <laughs> really. admitted, spoke about the deals and say they, saying that they knew what they really were. Once again, foresight people. This is why you need people like us to be able to say, here are the, the long-term consequences. Worst right. case scenario. Because guess what? Don't think worst case scenario can't happen, people. Yeah. Look at this. It totally fucking did. Right? Now, the government's case to actually charge any of these people was complicated and it took like four years right it was amazing now they did it right though they went after kind of the lower level guys and worked their way up and they learned from each trial some trials actually um 
ended with acquittals. Uh-huh. Because, and they realized when they polled the jury afterwards, it was because the juries got lost in all of these complicated financial tra- transactions things. So eventually the government's case evolved into something that I personally think is kind of brilliant. It really is, right? Instead of, when they finally charged Lay, Skilling, and the, the company's chief accountant, Causey, mm-hmm. right? Instead of saying, it like they had in previous trials, oh, this transaction was wire fraud, and this transaction was bank fraud, and when you said this, that was defrauding your investors. Instead, they charged, instead of specific transactions, they charged that the entire company as a whole was a fraud. No oh, shit. Which was brilliant. And they cut a deal with Kazi, the guy who was the chief accountant, mm-hmm. which cut out all the testimony about the specific accounting bullshit. Because mm-hmm. right? if they hadn't done that, that shit would still be going on today. Pretty much. Yeah. Like, so now by this point, Fastow had cut a deal, him and his wife. His, that was the thing you those were are the people. About. Those are the people that they got to switch off on their prison terms because they had kids or something. Kind of. But here's the thing is they needed him to testify. Mm-hmm. Now, what kills me about that is the judge actually for the refused to sign off on the wife's deal because he felt like she was getting off too easy. And I was like, she was just kind of the accomplice. She just filed false like tax, tax returns. returns. Why isn't he getting... It felt more... It felt like this bullshit like... Well, she's the harlot kind. I don't know if that's right. what it was. She tricked him into it. But it felt like bullshit. The deal originally was that she would get three months. She ended up getting a year. Uh-huh. And they agreed to hold off on Andy Fastow so he could take care of his kids. Now, they did that because they needed him to testify. Right. And he eventually testified against Lay and Skilling, saying they knew all of this, especially Skilling. Skilling knew what he was doing. He needed Andy to fill the holes from the, the money that never materialized from these magical promises right. he made to the market. He needed him. <clears throat> um, Skilling and Lay racked up over $100 million in their legal defense. <laughs> right? This is a, this is just like the Wait, final. how did they pay for it? This is the final insulting nail. Enron's insurance paid for it. Shut the fuck you so up. <laughs> Enron employees were paying to defend them for stealing all their money. Fuck off. Thank you. Fuck right off. Thank I mean, you. that's some... Uh-huh. <laughs> so... They, the government did an absolutely amazing job. And they convicted Ken and Skilling and Lay on almost everything. God. After after the conviction, Lay made a public statement saying something to the akin to, all things are right and just for those who love the Lord. Oh, and God. And the Lord would really? take care of it. And three months later, he dropped out of a heart attack. Which I find to be... And the Lord did take care of it. Oh, at his Aspen home. While vacationing oh. in Aspen, by the way. What kills me is at his funeral, all these rich folks and these religious leaders that he had donated millions to, they they absolutely just were like, the government killed him, and this is a modern day lynching. And I was like, oh, fuck off. Holding a rich white guy accountable for his crimes is a lynching? Fuck right off. Okay, so what about fuck all the people in you. California that died? Thank you. Fuck and you. What about all the people that probably killed themselves behind not having a job anymore and Thank lost you. everything that they had worked hard for? The people that were in the middle that didn't know what the fuck was going on. Mm-hmm. Well, some people, you know, a lot of people wrote checks to get out of trouble. Some people went to jail. Some people were acquitted. One person actually killed himself over this whole thing. His name was Cliff Baxter. He was actually the closest personally to Ken Lay. They, Ken, or to Jeff Skilling, excuse me. Skilling called him his best friend, and he was a manic depressive, and he was kind of part of a lot of the the fraud, really. But Sharon Watkins didn't quite know that, and she named Cliff in her memo because she was talking to Cliff Baxter about this before he left Enron, and Cliff Baxter was telling her that he was telling Ken Lay, and he was fighting with Skilling, trying to fix this, and all the stuff. She didn't know that he was actually kind of part of it, right? So he was named in the memo. Two weeks after uh, Congress released Sharon Watkins' memo to the public where Cliff Baxter was named, the press was hounding him, investigators were questioning him, and that's when he killed himself. Wow. And what he told Jeff Skilling was, the press is calling us child molesters. They're, They're saying that, you know, we killed people and we stole 
money right out of children's, you know, family's mouths. Like, and he's right. And he was like, but that'll never wash off. And he just couldn't live with that. Yeah, and that's... on one hand, I felt bad. But at the same time, you caught, you were you part of the created all this. You helped. You helped all this. And, and you It's tragic and it's heartbreaking, but. But you, you did this to yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, you There's have some to take accountability. There. Yeah, you have to take responsibility for it. Absolutely. Fasto <coughs> got out of prison. His wife got out, and she ended up going to school to be a nurse to pretty much like start over. Uh-huh. Fasto got out of prison. He goes around and does. He seems to kind of accept now, like what he did, and he goes around and actually makes a lot of speeches, a lot of times for free, about ethics and how people can get around them and why they're so important. And it feels like he's learned. This mm-hmm. lesson. I think I'm actually going to reach out to him as well because I, I'd love to talk to him. Just I'd love to talk to all these people. Um, but he got out of prison. Uh, Skelling is still in prison. <laughs> Everyone else wrote checks to get out of trouble. The uh, the auditing p- portion of Arthur Anderson no longer exists. Uh, some investment firms were actually barred from ever working in investments ever again. Wow. Um, because of what Enron did in <laughs> California, their governor was recalled. Now this is interesting. The California governor was recalled, and that's when Arnold Schwarzenegger was elected, right? That's how Arnold became that's how the governor. Arnold got the job. Here's what's interesting. There was a meeting that Ken Lay flew out and had with a bunch of energy executives in California uh-huh. that Arnold Schwarzenegger actually attended. Oh. The meeting, and that was before he started running. The meeting minutes have never materialized from that. But don't you think that's interesting? That's a little interesting because I feel like there's still something going on there. Because there's still there's still money to be had. What a coinky game! Still day. money to be made, mm-hmm. and I'm sure somebody has their hand in the cookie jar somewhere, and some of these people are still getting some sort of payment. Totally. When people question the political motives of W, he pushed out that he didn't do anything to help after the bankruptcy. I remember he had kind of Ken Lay had right. kind of been like, "Well, when you don't win the Texas governor, don't right. let that discourage you, right?" So he he was just like. Not me, done. right? Yeah. But in the last, in the first year of his presidency, Ken Lay actually met with Dick Cheney about seven different times. When Congress tried to subpoena the the notes from those meetings, Dick Cheney claimed executive privilege, and nobody has ever seen those notes. Fuck, I, you know this is the shit that kills me. Doesn't it remind? Doesn't it just take you right back into the days of W? Where oh, yeah, now, yeah. P- looking at Donald Trump, everybody's like, oh, they were so. I wish we had Bush right. back, but when oh, you do shit but, like this, it just right, instantly right. takes you back where you're like, fuck and no. Right, right. But still, where's the server? I fuck know, you. Right. Exactly. But the story really comes down to this. Like, it was always someone else's fault. People were paid to lose money. Even when it was all going away, employees felt that the top guys got their money. Why shouldn't they get theirs? Oh, and by the way, they were switching plan administrators while... Upper guys were selling their stocks Mm -hmm. because they weren't in their 401ks necessarily. The people with 401ks couldn't sell their stocks because they were switching plan administrators. Right. So people that had like $300,000 at the beginning of 2001, Uh, right? Had nothing. Sold it for $1,200. That's awful. Right. So once again, it was, you know, all these traders feeling like I should get mine, not realizing they were just complicit in the damage. That's awful. And in my mind, here's how it all rounds out. These are the things I think we have to remember, like lessons from this. Ideas are not everything. Execution is key. Foresight and big picture have to be considered. You have to understand worst case scenario. You have to live up to the standards you set for yourself, set budgets for what you actually value, and be willing to listen to the people that say that the duck's are actually dogs. For real. Oh my God. That wow. Is the story of Enron. Boys and girls. My God. Story time today was brought to you by. <laughs> I am so happy that I'm like, this has been weighing heavy on my brain. It's because it's just so much fucked up. Like every chapter of the book, it's just more and more and more galling and frustrating and fucked up up <sighs> even just realizing how many people actually got away with it yeah it's yeah. just galling i would have been so back in the day i wasn't like this but now i'm older my scary ass <laughs> would have been like 
Oh, no, I have to go now. I, I have to leave. Right? I mean, <clears throat> the minute I even heard an inkling of what was going on, I would have been scared. <laughs> it was like the feds were going to come in there and lock me up I at know, any time. Right? And these people were just willy-nilly playing with their lives and money and everything else. I don't Maybe it's because we don't we've never been put in that kind of position where that much money is thrown at us. And like I and like you said, that goes back to those experiments too. Like that much money is thrown in your face. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to be poor. Nobody wants no. to fucking struggle. You know? That But once but here's the thing is I think this is where people have to these people kind of lost their way. They even once they weren't poor, it still wasn't enough. No. It was never enough. It wasn't enough to have twenty million dollars. You had now to you have a hundred Yeah, million now I need another hundred million dollars. And and these people now, were like spending ex money on extravagant things that you just don't need. And what kills me is you have this Ken Lay guy, right? And he came I mean, I used he to live came in, from nothing. I used to live in Missouri, and I know there were some little podunk ass towns there. Mm -hmm. He came from absolutely nothing. His whole family was riding on a bunch of chickens. Mm -hmm. Come on now. <laughs> So he knew what it was. So I kind of, I understand that mentality. Like I'm never going back to that place again. Right. I will never put myself and my family in that position again. But you that, are putting yourself but in you that put, position. But now you've, you've worked so hard to get yourself someplace and now you've made it to where you're about to put yourself back in the chicken coop. Exactly. Because you can't rein in your spending, your spending and, and, and you just think, yeah, yeah. And to secure yourself because you believe and here's the thing, during the entire, during the entire crisis, right, Ken Lay and Jeff Skilling truly believed that the only problem was PR, that it wasn't really a problem with Enron. They would, people would still argue that well after the bankruptcy, that this was just a good business that was brought down by Andy Fastow. No, it wasn't. It was a bad business, but they believed that it was just the perception. And going back to his divorce, he really believed that he could just fix the perception, not actually doing the hard work, not actually digging the fucking ditch. Right, right. And perception is a big piece of it. But then there are people like us and other people who, okay, the perception is nice, but what's underneath that blanket? What's under the hood? What's under there? Because I need to know, because this all seems a little hinky to me. You can't just tell me. And they, they called it a black box. They were like, we don't know everything goes into the black box and money magically comes out. And it was like, okay, well, that's a magic trick. That's, that's not a that's business. That's not a business. Right. right. Yeah. It, it's, that's, that's just, I mean, and I, I, I don't know. I think, like I said, my, back in the day, I'd have been okay. My scary ass now, if that shit was going on, I'm mm -hmm. out. Oh, I am yeah. out. She's out. I'm not trying to go to prison behind whatever shenanigans and fuckery you got going on oh yeah you know i just i i can't do that but i i don't know it's it really felt but once again it's that it goes back to that stanford prison experiment they were placed in this new environment where there wasn't a lot of regulation and, right. and it was a new business that and the people really that had. were put in place to to uphold the regulations were bought off exactly or fired so you're you 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 put people in this scenario where there is no roadmap. There are no rules. You don't give them a corporate vision. You just say, go make money and figure it out. And they do. And this is what happens. Yeah, whenever you don't have, I don't want to say supervision, but when you don't have those rules in place to keep everybody's nose clean. You There's, can't treat rules like guidelines and guidelines like Yelp reviews. Oh, you're going to, and you're... Uh, inevitably there's going to be one dirty apple in the bunch you know who's going right. to try and do some shady shit and that happens from time but to time but you should look at that shady but you apple and be like, like oh, oh that, that looks like some good shit to do you made how much what you know yeah, right. that's just not how this works like that's that's i mean i look at where i work at right and we've had a lot of changes in the last six months mm -hmm. we've gotten a new ceo we've gotten a new cfo um and some of the changes that have been made are to are geared more towards hyping up our business and mm -hmm. and and bringing in more revenue. Um, and honestly, I don't believe in the trickle down effect either. But I feel like that's what's going on sometimes. But there, and and I can see like I'm looking at like our CEOs and our CFOs and our CMOs, all these people, and I'm I'm thinking like while we're sitting here doing this, like I wonder. <laughs> 
is that something that goes on in my building? Like it makes you question, it makes you think. Like I really do feel like wow. a lot of people. This should kind of be standard reading for people that are in business in any way or are in charge in any way to really realize that. And one of the guys in the documentary says that he's like, you do, you cheat a little bit to make your numbers. And then you have to do more cheating to make up for the old cheating. And sooner or later, it just snowballs. Yeah. It's realizing that these, if it's kind of like these people that are saying, oh, well, I was only one minute late and I'm the only one. Well, assuming that you're the only one that's doing something wrong, every, if everybody does it wrong, then you're going to sink your entire company. And that's why I feel like people people in charge at any company need to, to study this and understand what can possibly happen right. when you are not doing the right thing just because it's the right thing to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. You can't do that. You can't do that. I mean, I'm like 99.99% sure my company's on the up and up. Yeah. You know, I mean. But it does make you question. Our, our owner is is super like, you know. By the book. By the book. Yeah. yeah, you know. Which from everything you've told me about it, I it would shock me. It would shock the shit out of me. But, I mean, there's just that piece, that little bitty piece of, of a chance that, that there could be something going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Anything could happen. I mean, you take a small business like this. It's it's not. It's a small business. That's a very a small business that is growing, mm -hmm. and which seems like what Enron was. And they tried to grow really fast mm -hmm. and make a lot of money and and turn over a huge profit in just a short amount of time. And they had to figure out how to keep all this money coming in. I mean, you got people addicted to shopping and strippers and. You have you to know, fulfill everything the promises else that your that leaders have made. Yeah, yeah, you know. Have no re have no actual basis in reality. Yeah. Like and, you know, that can happen at any business. But they also created this culture that if you said, look, what you just promised isn't physically possible, you were shunned as not being smart enough, as not being what they called intellectually pure and not having what they called intellectual capital. You were just not smart enough. So, and if you were if you were labeled a loser or not smart, you you were gonna, gonna be a five to... and you were gonna be ranked and yanked. Right. Like that is the Isn't that the craziest story you've ever heard? Crazy. Like I said, this has been weighing in my brain and ranked I'm like, I gotta get this yanked. out of my fucking brain. So that is the Enron story. I'm oh. actually going to reach out to all the players and see if I can get an interview with any of them. I probably won't. See if anybody need a, anybody needs a girlfriend or something. I know, too, right? right? Good lord! Now that you're out of trouble, I mean, we can hang Give out. Me money? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Can I get a loan? I need like two grand. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I decided the other day that sixty thousand dollars would cure all my problems. There you go, and I would be fine. So let's feng shui your house for sixty thousand dollars, right? <laughs> so that is this our first deep dive series. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Jimmy V for suggesting this uh, for us. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I think next we should do the Gotti family or something. Uh, you know, I'm really into like the mobsters and shit. Yeah, I like all that stuff. Fun. Figure yeah. out a way to tie that into being a QA. Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> until next time, I'm Laura. And I'm Tanya. Love your faces. The smooches. <laughs> I'm just saying. Hey, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed this Enron deep dive. Like what you hear? Rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform. And follow us on our Facebook page by searching Q is in Cucumber. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram by searching QAIC underscore Lara, L-A-R-A, and QAIC underscore Tanya, T-A-N-Y-A. If you have a suggestion for what topic we should tackle next, please email us at Q is in Cucumber at yahoo.com. Don't forget to check out our other show, hosted by me and Jessica James, called The Parent Memoirs. And we want to hear from you. Share your stories by emailing us at qisincucumber at yahoo.com, and you might just hear your stories on a future episode. Love your faces! This call may be monitored and recorded for quality assurance.